I be in the will of God right now. I mean, you are doing what God wants you to do and it's tough and it's rough and it might be and I'm sure it is. But I want you to know it's more dangerous outside of the will of God. No matter how bad things are in God's will, they're much worse out of it. Now, turn with me to chapter number 30 tonight. I want to begin to read through some scriptures in just a minute. He ends up living in Ziklag for 16 months, becomes his base of operations. And let's read in 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that he nearly loses everything here. He nearly loses it all as he is in a place of despair and truthfully disobedience. He's for the very one of the very first times that we see in the life of David. He has not made a wise decision. He has made a rash decision. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city. Behold, it was burnt with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. They cried to the point of where their tears dried up. You may have been in a situation like this in your life. You have cried, you have fasted, and you have prayed before God, or you have made a decision. The consequences have been whatever. Somebody else has made a decision. It's broken your heart. The consequences of life have happened, and you, it looks like, it looks like, and maybe you're even there right now, it looks like everything's over. At this point in David's life, the anointing of Samuel those many years ago, and the promise of the throne and all these affirmations that he's received from Jonathan, even from Saul himself. The throne looks a million miles away. David is no closer to the throne than he was 20 years ago. His life is, is, is in a struggle, and he's at this point now where he is in absolute despair. He has made an unwise decision and he has reaped the consequences of it. And his heart is broken. And the men and the, and that are with him, their, their hearts are broken. And David's in a mess. He's a man with no country. Can't go home at the moment. Can't go to the Philistines. He's a man with no country. His faith is nearly exhausted. And yet, I want you to notice some beautiful words here. In the passage. Continue reading with me in verse number five. David's two wives were taken captives Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for surely thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail. Read those last two words. Now go with me to verse number 18. Verse number 18. I want you to see if we can see a recurring word here. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spool, nor anything they had taken to them. David, what's the next word? Recovered all. Recover. Recover. Get back what you lost. I want to speak to you tonight on this subject. The God of recovery. The God of recovery. Did you know God's in the Recovery business? Do you know he's in the restoring business? The reclaiming, redeeming business? This is our God. Our God is in the business of taking, yes, difficult things, hurtful things. He's in the ability and the process and the power to take our bad decisions and our consequences. And if we would give them over to him, God can help us recover that which we have lost. If he cannot, we have no hope. 
For is this not grace, recovery from sin? Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Is this not the power of salvation to be able to take those who have been bound in chains of sin and darkness and blindness and rebellion and God say, you have truly messed up your life and rebelled against me, but I will redeem you and I will change you and I will transform you and I will take you from a prisoner of darkness into the kingdom of my dear, God, God, my dear son. Is this not who God is? God's in the recovery and restoration business. I want you to see something in Isaiah 61. Turn with me rather quickly there, Isaiah 61. I just want you to notice that this is the message of the prophets to the nation of Israel. Oh, their message was often strong. Israel, you have rebelled. Israel, you have failed. Israel, you have apostatized, apostatized and you have uh, brought in an idolatry and you have done many wicked things. And yet in Isaiah 61... Look what God says to speaking of himself and the Lord Jesus Christ, who quoted this in Luke chapter number four. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that the Lord might be, that he might be glorified and they should build old waste. They shall raise up the former desolations. They shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. Look what he goes on to say in verse number Five, and the strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. The sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. And ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles in their glory. Shall you boast yourselves? And let, what, a, what a perfect expression in, of God's ability to recover people from sin. You're in this room tonight because God has the ability to recover people from sin. And I want you to know that you might be thinking, I, I, I see this and I see this, but I do not see how I can recover from that. I do not see how they can recover from that. That is because in your eyes it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. The God of recovery. If you were to write this reference down, we won't read it, but Joel begins his prophecy talking about the canker worm and, uh, and the judgment of God on what God has, and he's using some agricultural terms, quite frankly, on them. But he goes back and he says, that, that, that which the locust has eaten and all these things, he says, I'm, I'm going to take that back. In fact, let's just go there. Uh, go, how many times do we get to the book of Joel? We do tonight. Let's go to Joel. Run over there real quick. He said, where's that at? Look it up. Look in the book of Joel. God is a God of recovery. The God of recovery. Joel chapter, let's just look at number one. Joel chapter number one. And then we'll jump right over to chapter two. Won't be a very big leap. Joel chapter number one. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you old men. Give ear all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even the days of your fathers? Tell you your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left hath the caller caterpillar eaten. What is he saying? I'm about to, I, you're about to experience a level of judgment that is going to be generational. It's going to be rough. There's nothing left. You're, you've been decimated. But go with me to Joel chapter number 2. Just look at verse number 21. Just look at verse number 21. That's a rough way to start a letter, isn't it? It's like a letter from the IRS, right? You, you, you know, here we go. But look what he says in verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. Read that phrase with me of verse 21. Ready? Begin. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree that beareth their fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad. Then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent 
among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wonders with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you should know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else in my people shall never be ashamed. Is that recovery? Is that God taking man and his decisions and his rightful consequences? And by the way, I want you to know that you always, God is a God of mercy, but he is also a God of justice. You do suffer consequences for decisions that you make. But God is not done with you. You're in consequences. You're suffering. God's not done with you. Joel tells beautifully how God can take decimation Rightful so, and yet turn it around and bring praise and glory to God himself and joy to his people. Now back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30 tonight. David is in need of recovery, wouldn't you say? He has lost his wives, he's lost his children, he's lost respect, he's lost hope, he's lost a lot. He has nothing left and he is in need of of recovery. And I want to begin tonight, I hope I can get through this whole message this evening, three powerful principles that allow us to watch God begin the recovery process in our life. God to begin a recovery process in our life. Perhaps in this room tonight you've lost a relationship or there's a, a, a child issue going on, a marriage issue going on, there's a, a, a personal, I don't know, but you're saying, I do not see how God can turn this thing around. I, I just, I, we've tried every angle, we've tried to go every way that we can, we have no answers left. What do we do? The answer is, let the God of recovery work in your life. But if you're going to let him work in your life, you need to know how he works. Because if you, If you don't know how he works, you won't submit to his working. And the Bible does tell us in James to let patience have her perfect work. That literally means step back, submit to what God is doing and let God work in and through your life. So I want to see three things tonight. Lord, help us, please. David's lost a lot, but we know the end of the story. We know that his life and his ministry doesn't end in Ziklag. In fact, we understand because we've got several more chapters. We've got a few more books to speak of him, Lord. We, we, David's life isn't over. He's about to step into that next phase, that next plan that you have for him, Lord. He's about to become the king. He doesn't see that in chapter 30. All he knows is he needs you to help him recover the things that he's lost. Lord, tonight, strengthen our faith in who you are, in your power and your might. Guard our hearts from unbelief in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, principle number one, if you want God's recovery process to begin in your life, you need to understand this very clearly. God responds to us when we return to him. God responds to us When we return to him, one of my favorite lessons from the book of James is simply this. How you respond to trials determines how you get through them. How you react to trials determines how you get through them. And James says, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And the implication is clear that you might be going through something and you're going to have a fleshly desire to buck up against what God is doing, to rebel against what God is doing, or to totally miss what God is doing. And James says, stop, submit to the things of God and let God work in your life. And David says, listen, everything's falling apart. Samuel's anointing is gone. The throne is a million miles away. And we find here something in chapter number 30 that David does that we haven't seen for him chronologically in almost a year and a half. What do we find that David, what does he do here in chapter 30 that he has not done for almost a year and a half? He prays. If you remember that there are no psalms written, there's a psalm for basically every phase of David's life with the exception of his time in Ziklag. He lost his song in Ziklag. He he lost his sweet communion, uh, his his fellowship with the Lord in Ziklag. He, He was dry and he was barren and he had nothing. 
And yet he comes now up to Abathar and he says, listen, I've got nothing. I've got, I, 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 the guys are about ready to stone me. I, I, I've lost everything. And he says, I need to return to God. I need to go back to the Lord. He responds to God and God responds to him. I want to remind you what the Bible says tonight, that if you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh unto you. We understand this principle that, that God uh, has a, a holy character and sin does not destroy my sonship, but it sure does hurt my fellowship with God. Amen. I'm in a relationship with God. You that have parent, your parents and you have children, you know this. Your children sin, and that doesn't make them, you know, un DNA'd, right? Although you might want to kill them, but you don't get rid of them, amen? I mean, but. You feel like it, but boy, it sure does bring something in. And David has spent 16 months with no communion with God. The sweet psalmist of Israel, the man after God's own heart, we see no record of him ever talking to God, praising God, going to the Lord. That has been his response throughout his life. And yet he says, now I am going to return to my God. I'm going to respond to my God because I need God to help me here. I want you to notice three ways that God responds and David responded to God and God responded to him. As David returned to the Lord, God responded in a couple of ways. First of all, I want you to recognize tonight that God responded to David's inability. David's inability. God has allowed every single strong point of David's life to be removed. Do you recognize this? His wisdom can't help him. No mighty men of valor to help him. They're ready to kill him. The men who would do anything for him, who would lay down their lives for him, who would lay, risk their lives so he could get some water. These men are ready to kill him because their hearts are broken. Jonathan's not around. We're going to find out a little bit later that Jonathan's dying while all this is going on. Samuel's dead. David is cut off from his people, he's cut off from the land, he's cut off from his strength, and he's cut off from everything, and now he is all alone. And the only place he has to go is the place he should have always been running to, that is God. He's come to the end of himself. The Ziglag fiasco begins with David talking to himself, and I want you to recognize it ends when David starts talking to God. David gets into Ziklag because he leaned into his own understanding, but the situations and all that comes out of it begins to turn around and recover once David says, wait a minute, I've been doing this my own way this whole time. I need to just go back to that time when I used to talk to God in the morning, in the night, the meditations, and the, when I was on my bed, and when I rose up, and in the middle of the day, I need my relationship with God restored. And I want to go ahead and make this point tonight. The most important need you have tonight is not for God to change your circumstances, but for your heart to be right with God. James says, when you, when you ask God wisdom in a trial, James chapter number one, says, he says, let him you know, ask God nothing wavering. And the whole point is this. When you're going through a trial, when you're going through consequences of life, when you ask God wisdom how to deal with it, you don't tell him how to deal with it. You just say, whatever you say, I'll do. That's nothing wavering. The double-minded man is making his mind up about whether or not he's going to obey the next step that God gives him. But the man who doesn't know what he's doing says, God, I don't care what you say. I'll do whatever you say because my steps have gotten me into big trouble. Nothing reveals our desperation tonight. And I want to say this really clear what does David do? He prays. Nothing reveals our desperation and inability to run our own lives more than our prayerlessness or our prayer life. If we don't pray, we think we can figure it out. I want to say this to you tonight. There's probably no greater expression of pride than prayerlessness. The fact that I think I can get up, go through my day, make a myriad of decisions that affect my finances, my life, my wife, my children, my church family. To think that I can do that on my own, in my own strength, is a fool's errand. It's foolish, and it's dangerous, and it's delusional. I am desperately in need of God all the time, not just in bad times. 
And David begins to recognize. You say, did he come to a place of inability? He begins to recognize he doesn't have a place of inability. He was always unable to run his own life. See, I, I, we've got to get past this idea that we think, well, man, God's really got to get me down low. No, friend, God doesn't have to get us down low. We are low. There's, no, there's nothing good in us. It's Christ and Christ alone. And David says, I, I've got to go back to the Lord. And once he goes back to God and says, God, actually, I want what you have to say. I want to know what you want me to do. I want to know what steps you want me to take. Once he recognized that he could not run his own life, the recovery process begins. And you and I need to differentiate, by the way, between complaining and praying. We're not praying when we're telling everybody about it or we're thinking about it. David, David doesn't just sit there and muse on what has happened and get consumed with it. He prays. I want you to be very careful, truthfully, because sometimes we think if we talk about it a whole lot or we think about it a whole lot, that that's praying. But it's not. It's called being anxious. Be careful for nothing. Somebody help me out here now. It's called letting your heart be troubled. And I want to tell you very clearly tonight that if you need God to recover something in your life and you're trying to go about it any other way but through prayer, you're not going to get there. Prayer is God's means of changing things. Prayer is where God sends His, yes, His heavenly angels as ministering spirits to come and answer our prayers and help us. If we don't pray, we're not truly desperate enough. I'm amazed and confused. I don't know which at the amount of prayerlessness that we have in our lives and in our Christian circles. If we believed in prayer, we would pray. If we believed in corporate prayer, we'd pray together. Help me out here now. We pray personally, but we don't pray. And sometimes people say things like this. I pray with others but I'm embarrassed. Well, you might be embarrassed, but you're not desperate. See, David is the point. He knows he is completely unable to change this situation. The boy that picked up the slingshot without a second's thought, really. The guy who's doing all of these exploits, he now knows he's done some great things, but he has no ability to get his family back. He has no ability to reverse what has happened in Ziklag. He is totally unable to change things. And he is now at the point of desperation where he says, God, I need you desperately to work in this. The whole lesson of the parables on prayer and importunity is very clear. I heard many years ago somebody say this, and I want you to know, don't say amen to this because I disagree with it. So, amen. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I disagree with the following statement. I heard somebody once say, importunity is the refusal to take no as an answer from God. I think that's dangerous language. We don't tell God to do anything. Somebody help me out here now. Importunity is not about you saying, God, I'm not going to take anything but no for an answer. Importunity is saying, God, without you, I don't have an answer. That's the message of the parables and importunity. I've got to go to the unjust judge because you're the only one that can do this. I, I, friend, you're the only one that's got bread. I don't have anybody else. I don't have any other answers. And I want you to know tonight, as long as you've got some other answer, you'll never get the one that God can give you. We go to so many things and so many people. We hit Facebook. We hit Google. We, we, we look at this. And I think for all the good books that I have, I, I, I got a, I'm a book reader. But I want to tell you, there are, all the books I have don't compare to the 66 that I have in here. And nothing compares to the throne of grace. It is at the throne of grace where I find the help that I need. It is at the throne of grace where God's goodness and mercy pours out in my life. And we are looking so many places except looking to God. It is our prayer, our heart's desire, our desperation for God to move and to work. And I want to remind you again that importunity is about desperation. It's about saying, God, without you, I have, I have no other answer. I have no other source. Years ago, I wrote this down in the Bible. Sometimes God lets me get alone because God wants to get alone with me. I've got too much noise in my life. And God has to say, oh, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. 
It's just you and me, son. And I found, and you know this, that when it's just Him, He's all I need. He is sufficient and He works in our life. And God responds to David's inability to work out things in His own life. Number two, God responds to David's responsibility. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says here that David encouraged himself. Verse number six, in the Lord his God. So just in case I don't get far enough into this message tonight, I'm certainly I'm not going to. I want God to begin the recovery process in my life. It begins with you saying, I have no ability to fix this. My best efforts are going to fall way short, Lord. So I won't even try them. I'm done trying it my way. I want your way to be done and worked in my life. Number two, God responds to our responsibility. The Bible says that David encouraged himself. He doesn't have anyone to look to, right? I mean, he's, he's looking around. Who am I going to encourage? Everybody's got a rock in their hand. It's, it's kind of like a necessary thing there. I, I need to deal with myself. But here, really what the Bible is saying is this, that David encourages himself in the Lord. What he's literally saying is, I, I, I need to get need to get right with God about this. I need to look to God for this. I, I need to sit there and say, wait a minute, God, it, this is an issue between me and you. I want to say something. This is going to be a tough truth tonight. David, the reason David has to deal with himself is because David's the one who started this whole thing. David says, I'm responsible for getting us into this mess, God. And I'm responsible then for you helping me get us out of it. It's pretty easy to deal with the problem when you only have one culprit, though, isn't it? Isn't this kind of good, though? David can't look at all the men and say, you followed me. He, he, he can't blame Samuel. Samuel didn't have anything to do with this. David understands. I got us into Ziklag and I'm going to have to get us out. Please don't miss this tonight. When we accept our own responsibility and our own contribution to the chaos in our life, then and only then can God move. God grants healing and cleansing with responsibility. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confess means to agree, to accept responsibility for. David doesn't blame the, the, the Amalekites. He doesn't blame the king of, of the Philistines. He doesn't blame the general of the Philistines for rejecting him. He simply says, okay, Lord, I get this. Here's the issue. I brought us to this point and I want you to work in my life so that I can get us out of it. And listen to this great truth tonight. Some of you are wondering why God hasn't changed things in your life. It's because you haven't allowed those things to change you. You're still pointing fingers at people. This person, that person, that person. I would, but they. I would, but this. If, if they would have done this, then I could have done that. But here's the truth of the matter is. God is not so much as interested in changing your circumstances as He is as changing your own heart. We, we, we spend so much time blaming people for the situations of our life because, quite frankly, they're wrong. But I have found something very true in my own life. When I interact with the sinner, somebody else, I'm not the only one interacting, right? They're interacting with me too. And I contribute to problems. So y'all don't have to say amen to that and make, me, make my self-esteem drop tonight. But the, the bottom line is this. We are always looking for a scapegoat instead of saying, God, what have I contributed to this? Somebody help me out here now. We're looking out the window of all our problems and God says, I don't want you looking out the window. I want you looking in the mirror. What is God trying to do in your life through this thing? God changed this. God changed them. And God says, what about you? Why isn't anybody helping me? Because we can't do anything about you. It must be you and God who get your right relationship right. Somebody help me out here tonight. 
Boy, I feel like I'm preaching. Y'all forget how to act on Wednesday night? Come on here. All right. Just like you act on Sunday. Okay. Amen. Sometimes we, act, we want God to change. God, recover this. Why? You want God to change things, but you don't want to make any changes? How narcissistic are we? How selfish are we to think that we command God to fix issues in our life, but God has no room to fix us? And David says, I've got to get encouraged in the Lord. I've got to get walking with the Lord. I want to own up to all that's going on in my life. Years ago, I wrote a painful truth down. I wrote this. I won't point it at you so you don't get mad at me. I wrote this down. I've got to own up to the fact that my solutions are creating more problems. My solutions are creating more problems. Because our solution was to fix, 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 fix this, fix that, fix this person, fix this issue. I was looking everywhere else. And God says, you're looking everywhere but the wrong, but the right place. I was turning up every rock except the stunning ones in my heart. And David is so clear about what is going on. He says, Lord, I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm going to ask you, Lord, what should I do about this? I brought us to Ziklag. All right. They were wrong for stealing the wives. They were wrong for stealing the kids. How many of y'all say amen on that right there? But their wrong did not allow David to escape his own culpability in this issue. And sometimes we use others wrongs to justify our own. We get so consumed with God wanting to do something for us, we never see what he wants to do in us. Do this for me, God. And God wants to do it for you, but he wants to do something in you. God responds to David's owning up to this. Number three, I want you to know this. God responds to humility. When we return to God and come back to him in humility, God begins to work. Let me ask you guys a question and I don't answer it out loud. Why doesn't God send someone to David here? He's done that many times in his life. Samuel, Jonathan, people have come to him. Why doesn't God send someone to David? You ready for this? Because it wasn't who God who moved. It was David who left Israel. It was David who went out into his own will. It was David who went out of what he knew he was supposed to do. And therefore, it wasn't God. I'm going to say something. I'll go real strong with this. You might get a little strange about it, but it's true. It wasn't God's responsibility to come and chase David. It was David's responsibility to repent and return to God. Amen. Throughout Scripture, and I don't even have enough time. I looked them all up tonight. I looked many of them up tonight. How many times does God say, return to me? And I'll return to you. It's a promise. It's an open invitation. God says, listen, I, I haven't moved. I, I, I didn't push you out of here. I didn't cause you to rebel. Help me out here now. My, my rules weren't bad. You had a rebel's heart. No, you, I don't need to come over to you. You got to come over to me. Somebody help me out here now tonight. Again, James 4. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James says to Christians, he's not telling them to get saved again. He's saying you need to do what we used to call back in the South, you need to get, do some business with God. That's what we used to say. Y'all need to do some business with God. You need to get on your knees. You need to own up to what you've done. You need to say, I've caused this. I did this. And God, I humbly repent of my sin. And Lord, I'm coming over to your side. You don't have to get over to mine. Many things would be recovered in our life if we would just get our spiritual life where God wants it to be. There's always this open invitation. Let me read Jeremiah. I just want to read this to you. I've sent also to my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return you now every man from his evil way and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you and your fathers, but ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. And that's in Jeremiah, that's in Malachi, that's in multiple places throughout the Old Testament where God says to his people, Yes, you're experiencing consequences. Yes, I've judged you, but if you'll just return to me, if you'll just humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, then I can hear from heaven and I can heal your land. What does God say? The way that you experience God's recovery is not you telling God to get aligned with your purposes, but you get aligned with His will. 
This, this is really what it's all about. God, I don't need to get you on my side to act on my behalf. I need to submit to you and just get under your wings. It's beautiful what David does here. God responds to us when we return to Him. And I would wonder tonight if we would just be honest with ourselves and with the Lord and say, I've been trying to do this my whole self. I've been trying to fix all of this at work or with my aunt or with my whoever. And I've been doing it without you. And Lord, I don't have, I'm out. I'm tapped out. My wisdom's gone. I don't have any more asks. You guys know what I'm talking about? You go and ask, try to ask somebody. It, just, it don't work. And now i got nothing left. And so, Lord, I'm just coming to you with it all and saying, you know what, I need you. I wonder if you're willing to accept your responsibility. And we got to get careful. Well, it's 80% their fault and 20% mine. It might be, but own the 20. Sure, come on, help me out here now. I have yet to find anybody walking this earth who is sinless. If you find them, let me know. We'll go whoop on them. Amen? I mean, just like, there's nobody on. It, you might not be in the, you might have 1%. Right? I don't know how to quantify that in what's going on in your life, your family, whatever it might be, but just own your part. My, my solutions are creating more problems, God. I, I own mine. Somebody help me out here tonight. We don't ever want to own up to anything. And then God responds to humility. As David cries unto the Lord and asks him, Lord, what should I do? I want you to read with me verse number 9. Actually, I tell you what I'm going to do. Because I can't finish the third point, and I don't want to get the third to start the second. Let's stand tonight. I don't want to rush through this. And no, I didn't run out of anything to say. Still got notes, 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 right? I wonder if we'd first of all just be willing tonight here in church just to say, okay, I'm not going to ignore the problems of my life or the consequences or what's going on. I'm actually going to seek God about this because sometimes we give up on dealing with things. I've prayed a hundred times. Well, pray a hundred more. I've been knocked down seven times. Get up one more. And give God a chance through submission and obedience to begin the recovery process in your life. In case I forget to say this next week, who knows if I will or if I won't. Recovery don't happen overnight. You don't have 25 years of dysfunction fixed in one night. David gets it in this story. But it always does begin with one step. Even though things don't change immediately, they are beginning to change if you begin to draw nigh to God. Let's have a word of prayer tonight. Let's spend a little time in prayer tonight. Let's go before the Lord tonight. And let me ask you, without you raising your hand or saying anything at all, because it's not really any of our business anyway, what have you lost? What needs to be recovered? Would you return to God tonight? Would you ask God for a sweetness in your spirit, a humility in your spirit, a responsibility of, okay, I, I, I see where I've stepped out of bounds here and let God begin to work because I, I, God is the God of the impossible. I don't care what situation is represented in this room. I don't care what it is. It is not out of God's reach. There is nothing outside of God's capability. But what about there is nothing outside of God's capability? Nothing. Nothing. Lord, we come tonight. 
Lord, I'm not promising some type of silver bullet or magic potion. Poof, everything's great tomorrow morning. But Lord, I do believe tonight we can at least begin to see some things recovered in our lives. Lord, when these large ocean liners and these large ships begin to turn around, they don't turn around immediately, but they begin turning. Things begin to change slowly but surely. And Lord, that's many times how you work in our life. It begins with one step, followed by another, followed by another, followed by another. Lord, I would perhaps begin tonight, Lord, there may need some, be some folks in here who would return tonight with just the, the first step they need to take is say, I, I'm done trying, but I'm not quitting. I'm done doing it my way, but I, I'm not giving up on what God can do. Lord, I just pray tonight that they'd surrender. Surrender to you. Surrender to your power. Surrender to your strength. Surrender to your goodness and your ability to work all things together for good to them that love God, to them are called according to His purpose. You are in the business of recovering things and recovering people. The Lord, tonight may we just begin by saying, Lord, I, I confess my inability. I have tried so many things. I have worried and I have complained and I have fretted, but I haven't really prayed. Lord, may we own our own sin, own our own contributions, own our own missteps, Lord. And it might be the truth. We may not be in the majority of the wrong, Lord. We, we may have not caused it or started it or even finished it, Lord, but maybe we responded in the wrong way or, or we didn't respond the way that we should, Lord. I look back at so many things in my own life. I think I could have just stepped a little left instead of stepping right. I could have humbled myself a little bit more. Lord, may we begin to own that so that we can have what we call spiritual integrity before you. And Lord, may we humble ourselves. How humbling it must have been for David, this great warrior to have nothing in front of his warriors, to have no answers, to have no ability. But Lord, we often find that when we get to the end of ourselves, that's where you begin. And when you are all that we have, you are all that we need. Lord, we humble ourselves tonight. We pray. We seek your face. We turn from our wicked ways. Hear from heaven. Heal our land, our families, our lives, Lord, our relationships, Lord. Whatever might be in this room. Again, Lord, there is nothing outside of your reach. You respond to us when we return to you. Thank you for the gracious invitation to return unto you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for you are faithful and just. So, Lord, tonight we want to draw nigh to you. And we want to say to you tonight, before we ask you to fix any situation, before we ask you to change any circumstance, before we ask you to change anything, we ask that the change begins in our own hearts. Our own hearts, our own minds, our own actions, our own responses. And Lord, may we look in the mirror and not out the window. And we will thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. By the grace of God, we'll finish this message up next Wednesday night. But who knows? Maybe we'll be in it for five weeks. I don't know. All right, It just seems what will happen right there. Praise the Lord for you guys tonight. Shake hands with one another. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed.